Good afternoon. I'm Len Leader, a longtime uh, FDD uh, board member. And uh, this afternoon, I have the honor of introducing two distinguished American leaders, Senators Joseph Lieberman and John Kyle. Though they come from different parties uh, on the most important issues, uh, they have fought on the same side. Indeed, few statesmen have done more to advance the causes of freedom, human rights, and democratic governance than they have. Most recently, they have worked together to prevent Iran's rollers, the world's leading sponsors of terrorism and chronic human rights violators uh, in their home uh, from acquiring nuclear weapons. They leave impressive legacies, and I'm confident that they will have much more to contribute after they retire from Congress at the end of this term. Over the past decade, both have worked very closely and productively with FDD, for which we are very, very grateful. I'll now turn the microphone over to FDD's president, Cliff May, who will moderate a discussion and Q&A session with the senators and present them with a much-deserved award. Please join me in welcoming Senators Joseph Lieberman and John Call to FDD's Washington Forum. I have a, a couple of countrymen here. I mean Connecticut, of course. <laughs> <laughs> Len, thank you so much. I'm, uh, th thank you. I'm going to thank you more formally in a few minutes. But I want to start off with a conversation. This is really a wonderful time to sort of pick your brains and, 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 and talk with you. Let me start with you, uh, if I may, Senator Lieberman. When you came into Congress, uh, the United States was engaged in a Cold War against totalitarian regimes, and movements, and ideology. As you leave the Senate, the United States is engaged in a, an asymmetrical war against, I would argue, totalitarian regimes, movements, and ideologies. Right. Have we made any progress? <laughs> uh, well, yeah, we, we have made progress. Um, I, I was about to quote Lenin. <laughs> Sometimes it's two <laughs> steps forward and one step backward, but the net is uh, positive. Uh, actually, it just strikes me that, um, uh, that obviously the, the, it was enormous progress when the Berlin Wall went down, when the uh, uh, Soviet Union collapsed, and uh, we've watched a, a really remarkable expansion of freedom generally throughout Central and Eastern Europe, but, uh, but sadly in Russia itself, uh, we haven't. We've seen a return to autocracy, not quite as bad as the old Stalinist days, but bad. And uh, I just mentioned this because the Senate this morning adopted uh, the Magnitsky Act, um, 92 to 4, I think, which is a great statement. Okay, so back to your, oh, thank you. <laughs> 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 right. And you know, I, I said to one of my colleagues that uh, uh, there are days you'll be shocked by this, I'm sure, in recent times when I've left the Senate wondering whether I really had done anything that would matter uh, during that day. Today, having uh, voted uh, as part of a large majority for the Magnitsky Act, um, I think we've done something significant. So, uh, yeah, this is history, you know, uh, the victory over uh, communism in the Soviet un Union was remarkable, and, and yet, um, somehow uh, the respite from conflict and attack was short. Um, there are lessons to be learned. I mean, ultimately, just to make a few comments, the, um, um, both of these were ideological conflicts at their heart. Um, and uh, uh, it's, sometimes people miss that, I think, in, in, the, in the conflict we're in with Islamist extremism and terrorism. But, it's, it's an, it is a theology, but it's an ideology. It's a set of ideas. The other hopeful thing to say is that, um, that ultimately, uh, as generally happens through history, uh, communism collapsed at, at the weight of its own repression and evil and extremism. And um, I'm confident that the same will be true of Islamist extremism and terrorism. But the other lessons, obviously, are that uh, 
you, you have to be clear in, uh, in making the ideological counter-argument, which we did for a long time against the communists, uh, and it was that was critical to the ultimate victory we secured. The other thing is that we, we have to remain strong and, uh, and unrelenting in our willingness to use our strength to protect our security and our values against these ideologies, which were, were, were then and now are both quite uh, inhumanely uh, militarized. Um, and and um, we have to have patience. Um, and that's a real challenge for us in a democracy uh, because, um, you know, this, the Cold War didn't end quickly uh, and it took strong leadership to end it. Um, this conflict w against uh, extremely uh, unconventional enemy will not end quickly either. And in our democracy, we're going to have to, hopefully without suffering anything like the attack of 9-11, uh, continue to convince the, the American people that we've got to stay engaged, uh, 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 keep our defenses high, and remain on, on the offense, both ideologically and um, militarily. Senator Collins, I'd like you to also compare and contrast the Cold War to the current conflict any way that you want to. But this also occurs to me. We talk about communism. And probably among ourselves here, we'll talk about Islamism and jihadism as ideologies. As you all know, there are many people in the U.S. government, very high positions, not just in one party, who will not use those words. We are fighting, as they say, violent extremists. A violent extremist, almost by definition, has no coherent set of beliefs. It seems to me, and I think it seems to you, I think I know you well enough, that if you don't understand and won't delve into the ideology of, you, of those who proclaim themselves to be your enemies, you can't understand them. And if you can't understand them, you're going to have a very tough time defeating them. Exactly so. And first, uh, let me compliment Senator Lieberman. As usual, everything he said was wise on point, <laughs> needs to be considered as part of this overall. Uh, your last comment reminds me that uh, Jim Woolsey, who is here, the three of us, and uh, several others joined together on the second iteration of the Committee on Present Danger, which right. then brings us back to your comparison, which is at the Cold War and the war against this uh, Islamist um, uh, theological, ideological uh, uh, movement. Are, th there are many, many parallels. Obviously, they are different ideologies, but you start with the proposition that the the enemy here uh, in both cases was an ideology. You cannot therefore defeat it without engaging the ideology. You cannot engage the ideology unless you understand it and unless you're willing to call it by its name. So you start with the proposition, you can go all the way back to Sun Zhu. Um, uh, if you don't know your enemy, you're not likely to beat him, especially an enemy like this, which has a lot of very clever uh, components to its way of fighting. And uh, so, Point number one is you've got to know the enemy, you've got to be realistic in calling it by its name, and then begin to develop the ways of defeating it. Uh, Senator Lieberman is exactly right. The Cold War took a long time to win, and I sometimes think we, we won it to some extent by accident, but think of the things that were done that were not by accident and that could form the basis for at least an analysis of how you win, th win this. Point number one Joe made is you've got to be strong as a nation, uh, militarily and in whatever other ways are necessary to confront this particular kind of enemy. Uh, second point is, what are the, the strengths and weaknesses of the opponent here? What is the methodology for advancing this Islamist movement? And where might it, uh, its weak points be? And how do you take advantage of those? This requires a different kind of thinking about how to approach this enemy. I don't think we've done that yet. We've, to some extent, been on defense from day one, though we have on, on occasions employed offensive techniques, and by and large, they're pretty effective. Intelligence, we understand, is a critical component of this battle, maybe even more so than the last, but it was important then, too. Um, we've had some reorganization of our government, and we've uh, certainly had uh, a, a couple of wars. Uh, we think of Afghanistan right now, and I just maybe that's the last point in the microcosm, okay? So we're going to leave Afghanistan, and what 
I mean, is there anybody here who believes that in five years, Afghanistan is going to look very much different than it did, say, two weeks before 9-11, when I was on the Khyber Pass, as, as a member of the Intelligence Committee with the Chairman of the House and Senate Intel Committees? Is it going to look any different? It's a lot of uh, blood and treasure spent, um, maybe not to very good effect. You're not going to win the war that way. And the final point, the final, final point, <laughs> um, uh, is that we, we could, because we are an impatient people by nature, uh, and because the enemy in this case is extraordinarily patient, uh, well, I'm not going to say we could lose it, because at the end of the day we have no choice but to win it, but it'll be a lot longer struggle if we don't appreciate the fact that time, the time element here, uh, is important because we are a democracy, as, as Joe pointed out. And as my colleague John McCain, our colleague John McCain likes to point out, the Afghani who said, well, you've got the watches, but we've got the time. And that's just one illustration of, of how this is perhaps a little different than the Cold War, but how you've got to take all of these elements into account in order to devise a strategy and then the tactics and then decide where that leads you in terms of military expenditures and all those sorts of things. And there's a number of things you both said that I want to drill down on, but before I do, I want to ask one more broad brush a question. This conference is entitled um, Dictators and Dissidents, and asks the question, should we be choosing between uh, dictators and dissidents? And, I, and we mean it as a serious question, um, I, because I think there are a lot of people on the left and on the right at this point who see no value in that, who don't think we can have a... Have a uh, have an, an impact that is, that is useful and helpful. And there is a difference I would submit, and this is what I, wanna, I want you to address, between on the one hand exporting democracy, on another hand supporting Democrats who share our values rather than leaving them on their own, um, or simply some other option or some other policy. Uh, and this is, I think, very timely right now and we'll drill into this in a minute, because you have t today, uh, Kairi Abbas, one of our senior fellows, is just back from Egypt. I just saw him in the hall a few minutes ago. The palace, Morsi's palace is surrounded by people who do not want to trade one form of despotism for, for another, do not want to trade autocracy for theocracy. Now the question not only is do we help them, do we leave it all alone, or do we help Morsi and perhaps empower him to establish a theocratic dictatorship regime of the Muslim Brotherhood, which we will be told this will be the moderate Muslim Brotherhood. So I've opened up a several doors for you. Let me ask you to, in two or three words, yes uh, or no? <coughs> well, <laughs> so let me see. As, as I look behind me and see that we are guests of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies. Plural. It's, and, it's, and a, and it's, an, uh, it's an easy answer, but it's one that I, <laughs> I feel deeply. Um, which is obviously in the choice between uh, dictatorship is the dictators and dissidents. We've always got to go with the dissidents, the, 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 because that's who we are. I mean, we're a nation founded on a set of principles uh, that have uh, uh, never perfectly, but much more often than not, and much more than most other nations, have guided our behavior. And those principles are, you know, found most, most uh, eloquently and compellingly in the Declaration of Independence. We're, we have a mission, which is uh, the same reason that the founders uh, created, form, formed the government, which was to uh, secure the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That should always be our guidepost in, in foreign relations. It's, it's a, because it's a complicated world, and because we're not perfect, we will make compromises on that ideal. But we're always better uh, off internationally when um, our foreign policy ref reflects our founding values, which are freedom. And, um, um, and, and it's not only that we feel better about it and it's more consistent with our national ideals, in the long run it usually works out better. So uh, uh, I hope I, that's the beginning of a general uh, answer uh, to your question. And you know, at every point, uh, well, I'll talk briefly about the Arab Spring. So, so the, the Arab Spring has pre presented somebody like me and probably a lot of others with, um, incidentally, I'll come back to one other point. Yeah. This is about the parties, uh, the political parties in our country and um, um, how, the, uh, how this value of freedom sometimes gets a bad name, you know. Um, 
I, I got motivated, like a lot of people in my generation, into uh, public service by President Kennedy. And, uh, you know, we were inspired by the words of his inaugural, uh, not just ask, don't ask what your country can do for you, but what you can do for your country, but this is a nation that will be prepared to pay any price and bear any bur burden for the survival and sustenance, really the expansion of liberty. Very neocon idea. Very neocon, that's exactly the point I wanted to make. So then suddenly you read, I just saw a column somewhere <laughs> where somebody was talking about, we gotta get over this neocon nonsense of a freedom agenda, this neocon Bush nonsense of a freedom agenda. Well, to me that was the Kennedy agenda, it was the Truman agenda, it's an American agenda. Uh, maybe I should stop at that and let John well, let me just follow. <laughs> <laughs> let me just put you on the spot a little bit with one specific question out of that. Yeah. If you were, at, at this point, telling the, um, our ambassador in Cairo yeah. what to be telling M Morsi, what right. would you say? I would say that, um, they, uh, that we should be telling Morsi, look, um, there's already a lot of skepticism about you in America because, you know, we've read the Muslim Brotherhood documents historically and they they're not consistent with our values, but okay, you won the election, so, um, and it's very important for us to have good relations between Egypt and the United States. You're a great nation, you're a center of the Arab world, but you know, we're gonna judge you not by your title with the Muslim Brotherhood, but by your actions. And to be more specific, as grateful as we were two weeks ago that you, um, Mr. President Morsi, uh, helped us uh, um, end the conflict in Gaza, um, if, if the next day or two days after you suspend the right of judicial review, uh, et cetera, et cetera, we're not gonna be able to have normal relations with you. And, and probably if we, uh, I was in the White House, I'd say, Mr. President Morsi, no matter what we in the White House wanted to do, those lunatics on Capitol Hill <laughs> force us not to have normal relations with you. It's always good to have lunatics on Capitol Hill. And no, and no danger that will change. Well, you to, I, I see no, no danger that uh, uh, with Joe, Joe's departure in mind. <laughs> I, I, I'll see if Joe agrees with this. I, so would you put us in the realism branch of the Natan Sharansky School of... Uh, <laughs> How could I say sort no? Of like, we have to be on the side of the dissidents, but don't have to be stupid about it. I guess that's <laughs> the way it is. Um, life is full of compromises. Marriages are full of compromises. Families, governments, and there cannot, I mean, it, it would be very odd indeed if everything were clear cut and black and white and dealing with situations like all of the complications from the Arab Spring that set up the uh, the tensions between the dissidents and, and the, the dictators, as you put it. So we don't have to be um, cowed by the fact that there are some very difficult questions presented here. And sometimes the compromises are not apparent, they're difficult, but, so, how do you ha so how do you make the decisions? Well, you have to handle them, you have to try to influence the setting of the stage rather than just always reacting to what is presented to you. And you best do that by having some foresight and good intelligence. I, I go back to good intelligence and always by having a coherent philosophy that maybe not day in and day out, maybe not even week in and week out, but year in and year out, you're going to try to stay as close on that line as you can be, knowing they're going to vary a little bit to the left and the right uh, as circumstances require it. But we'll, we'll not only have a lot better chance of winning, but be much more credible with everybody else in the world if they know what our, what our North Star is. It's where we want to go, and uh, sometimes we're going to have to tack. If you're in sailing, you know what this is all about. Uh, so you'll have to do that sometimes, but always with the, with the end goal in mind. And if people understand that, then they'll be a little bit more forgiving of some of the tacking, and we won't be a subject to criticism for being hypocritical about this or that or the other thing. Uh, but, you, but people have to understand what your ultimate goal is here. And, and, and it, I, I kidded about it, but I... I think a realistic school of Sharansky is kind of a good way to describe it. Let me start with you on the next question, and that is uh, Syria, which we talked about quite a bit this morning. Are we on the right track in terms of influencing the situa situation in Syria? Can we influence the situation still? Could we have pre if we had gotten in earlier? Well, here's where I'm going to punt just a little bit. Um, I don't know nearly enough about everything to be able to answer that question really intelligently. And one of my 
uh, approaches to problem solving is, uh, first of all, I don't Twitter. I try to think <laughs> carefully about what I'm going to say before I say it. Um, frequently comes in handy and you don't have as much to explain later, but don't <laughs> express an opinion unless you really understand the facts on the ground. And I don't well enough to express an opinion. I do think that we might have somewhat better choices had we had a more coherent policy going in because I don't think it has been very coherent and as a result some of the choices we have are far less uh, benign than or, or at least uh, potentially productive than they otherwise might have been so I'm going to punt that question just a little bit. Sure I have ideas I, I think by the way after watching him for uh, 26 years in the United States Congress our, our colleague John McCain has some of the best quick instincts, uh, all of his instincts are quick, uh, <laughs> but uh, he sizes up situations involving national security and foreign matters very, very well. And uh, I, I subscribe generally to the kinds of approaches that he's advocated throughout this conflict, but, uh, but beyond that, I uh, further affiance saith not. Syria? Yeah, I mean, to me, this is the classic case of a dictator versus dissidents. And uh, I, I've been increasingly uh, frustrated, disappointed, angry that uh, the U.S. hasn't uh, been much more proactive in support of the dissidents in uh, Syria, um, both because they were on the side of freedom when they started out peacefully, then Assad started a fire at them, and, and increasingly it really became a humanitarian uh, disaster and also I mean I don't know that in my 24 years in the Senate I uh, probably should think about it before I say something that uh, but like uh, comparing but th this is a case where there's an awful lot of uh, uh, values and strategic interests of our country coming together as they usually don't in foreign policy and the obvious strategic interest well two but the one big one is that you know Assad is the number one friend of our number one enemy Iran and uh, his uh, collapse um, would be probably as significant a body blow to the regime at the top in Tehran as anything we could do. And, and that will, would, would in some ways increase our, I think increase our leverage over Iran when it comes to their nuclear program, um, maybe even as much as uh, the sanctions do because the fall of Assad will, would affect the top of the regime including the uh, IRGC. So. Um, you know, I, uh, the, other, the other strategic reason is that uh, I think that um, the longer we've waited to get involved, the more um, uh, natural vengeance comes up because of all the killing that's gone on, the more uh, uh, jihadist fighters have come in. It started out, I, I, I spent a fair amount of time on this, and with John McCain we've gone to uh, three times to Turkey to meet with the opposition and Free Syrian Army that came out to meet us. I went once to Lebanon to do that. I think this started out really as a patriotic anti-dictator movement and uh, it's still more that than anything else but it's clear that uh, Al-Qaeda type or related people have come into it. So the danger here is that, um, uh, now there's a lot of dangers, but one is that that Assad retreats essentially to, an, uh, to create an Alawite province with the uh, chemical and biological weapons um, and um, the rest of the country um, it goes into civil war. The, the, the Sunni nationalists, the Sunni extremists, the Kurds and the, and the Arabs fighting and uh, it actually expands what I think will be in some ways the most consequential threat to stability in the Middle East in the next chapter and it's not going to be the Israeli-Palestinian conflict which is has, is significant, but it's going to be the Sunni-Shia conflict in the Muslim world uh, expressed in all the ways it does. So I, I think we've waited too long. I, I hope that we will immediately, the administration will recognize this new coalition opposition that they helped to put together that will give them weapons and that with uh, both the neighbors of Syria and uh, our allies in Europe, some of which have now been ahead of us like France and Britain, that we will uh, focus in on this immediate, um, really potentially disastrous threat that Assad will use chemical and biological weapons. You said a moment ago that uh, Iran is our most dangerous enemy. Right. If so, how far should we be willing to go to prevent Iran 
from acquiring nuclear weapons? Well, you know, I just echo what everybody has said right up to President Obama, that it's unacceptable uh, to, for us to allow Iran to become a nuclear state, that, that uh, containment is not an acceptable alternative for all the reasons we know. I think that's absolutely right. It changes the whole balance of power in the Middle East. It emboldens the terrorists that, uh, like Hamas and Hezbollah that are agents of uh, the Iranian government. It probably, unless we're strong, leads some of our allies in the Arab world to begin to accommodate to Iran. And it's a threat uh, to most of the rest of the world, including us. Um, so, you know, the sanctions have been unprecedented. They're having an effect on the Iranian economy. So far, uh, not, a, not an observable effect on the Iranian regime at all. And so I think, you know, we have to, um, we have to make sure that our threat of military action if they don't um, take down their nuclear weapons program is credible to them. I'm still not sure it is. But they've got to believe that the U.S. will use our, our, our immense power to disable their nuclear program if they don't uh, do it themselves. Senator Kyle, is, is, may, may, may I just interrupt and make one comment directly pertaining yeah. to the overall theme here? Starting a long time ago, years ago, I think our sanctions regime should not only have been stronger, but it should have been oriented in a slightly different direction. We should have been saying to the people of Iran in very clear and firm way, uh, our quarrel is not with the Iranian regime creating nuclear weapons alone. It is the Iranian regime acting in all ways that it does, including to repress your freedoms. And recognize the fact that the average Iranian on the street is probably pretty proud of the capability of uh, generating nuclear weapons, nuclear capability to begin with, and they're probably nationalistic enough to be proud of the weaponry that would be created. Um, so that if sanctions are really going to work by impacting the will of the people and therefore the action of the people, People have to believe we're not doing it just in our own self-interest, but we're also doing it and maybe primarily doing it for their self-interest, to give them the ability to reassert control over their future, over their country, over their government. If they have a stake in it too, then the fact that they are impacted so negatively in personal ways is much more bearable by them. And it's, I guess this is a microcosm of a point I'd make in a larger way. We should be there should be a whole lot more Radio Free Europe and, and uh, all of the other uh, voices of the American ideal telling people what we're for, why we're for it, why we share their aspirations, and whatever actions we're taking, hopefully, are consistent with those things. It's an important point. I think it's a usually important point. Is if there's any people in the Muslim world, so-called, who understand what Islam Islamist rule is like. Yeah. It is the Iranians after 33 years, and they know it doesn't, it doesn't work. Senator Lieberman said a moment ago that our threat, our military threat, to the Iranian regime, not to the, the people of Iran, must be credible. Is it credible to you? Can you imagine this president, President Obama, using military force to stop Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons? Well, you have to let's, let's get into some definitions. You've got a United States attack. You've got a an Israeli attack, you have a combination attack, you have an Israeli attack backed by some elements of U.S. force, footnote, or after the fact, backed by some elements of U.S. force. I mean, there are all kinds of iterations here. Um, I think the Iranians are probably nervous, but not nervous enough, obviously. So the rather apparent answer is uh, the threat probably isn't credible enough. Mm -hmm. um, Gaza is ruled by Hamas, which uh, has used the territory since the Israelis withdrew in 2005 uh, as a basis for terrorism and missile launches. Um, the West Bank is more or less ruled by the PLO, which recently, after four years of not negotiating with the Israelis, went to the UN and asked for upgraded status. Uh, do the Israelis have anyone to negotiate a peace process with at this point? And if they did negotiate, and let's suppose that Abbas came tomorrow to negotiate the peace process after four years of refusing to do so without concessions in advance, 
could he sign a paper that would be at all meaningful? Would he be able to bring Hamas into it, which is dedicated to the extermination of Israel? Is there really any, reason, any way to, to believe that Israel could have a separate peace in the midst of a global conflict with Islamism or have peace before the rest of the world settles its battles with Islamism? Well, it's possible, but it's, it's, it, it, it's very hard at this point to imagine. It would not come uh, easily for all the questions, for all the qu reasons that your questions uh, embody. I mean, in the first place, um, right now Israel faces a Palestinian people that are divided uh, between uh, two governments. So making peace with one wouldn't give them the, the security or the confidence to take the risks that they will have to take as part of any process, peace process. Um, I, I've been, I was encouraged by one of the stories that was in the news a couple of days ago, that, which I was wondering about happening, which is that people in Gaza are beginning to take a second look at Hamas uh, because of how, how much they, they suffered in the, the last conflict because Hamas was doing something that wasn't for the people of Gaza. They were firing rockets into Israel because Iran was asking them uh, to do that. And uh, ho hopefully that will lead at some point to um, more unpopularity for Hamas. So. What I'm saying is that the ideal would be that there really were elections that were genuine in, uh, in, both, in both in the West Bank and in Gaza. It's a big uh, desire. And it produced a government that uh, had some credibility uh, in all parts of the Palestinian community that could negotiate with the Israelis. Um, to imagine a, a settlement of all of the, the final status questions really uh, takes a, an optimist <laughs> beyond uh, my capacity for optimism, and I'm an optimistic person by nature. <laughs> so uh, the question is whether they could, uh, uh, you know, could negotiate sort of tentative agreements on some of the issues involved here. But um, you know, this is a this is a case where people in Israel really yearn for uh, peace and a two-state, the majority, two-state solution. And yet, as you know, and I've seen this in recent polling from Israel that most of them have uh, just given up on it in the foreseeable future because they don't see a partner uh, who's prepared to negotiate and uh, I, I don't blame them. I don't think Abbas is prepared to negotiate but let's suppose just for the sake of argument that he is and does and let's suppose on Friday he sits down with Netanyahu, shakes hands and comes to a deal by Friday dinner. Will he survive through Sunday breakfast? <laughs> Under current circumstances, probably uh, uh, his days would be numbered. I'm not talking about his life, but his power. Um, Joe analyzed it exactly correctly. Uh, first of all, they're totally divided. Secondly, they have no leadership capable of, of making a deal. Um, and part of it is of their own making. You cannot start with the education of little kids. Um, teaching them to hate Israel and everything that it stands for uh, and hope to have support from the people when you make a deal like that. So um, there are a lot of conditions for this to work and it can't happen overnight. So uh, as I said, part of the problem is they've created their own problem for acceptance of any kind of a reasonable deal. You express some pessimism well, or realism about what's likely to happen in Afghanistan uh, after the departure of substantial numbers of U.S. troops. Uh, that'll be back essentially to where it was before 9-11. Uh, what happens to Pakistan after that, which is Islamist, um, which is semi-democratic, but with the emphasis on the semi, and which of course is nuclear armed? This just uh, adds to the conundrum of the entire area and, uh, and how we deal with it. And I go back to where I started. Uh, if you have some first principles, that you try to apply in any controversy and recognize that as you apply them there will be circumstances where some nuance and, and uh, potential compromise is required, uh, then you approach all of these problems that way. If you have very good intelligence, you can understand better what's going on within the Pakistani society and Pakistani government. If you have a strong military, you have the ability to control events more than be controlled by them. If you have strong allies, you have the ability to sway opinion, say, with India, uh, 
just by, by way of example, and so on and so on and so on, which goes back again to Joe's first point and mine. Um, if you look at all of these problems as they exist today, you can easily become um, very uh, pessimistic about our ability to deal with them and maybe make the wrong kind of conclusions or compromises based on that. If you go back to the question, how would we go about winning the war against this um, Islamist ideology? Uh, political Islam is the, is the moniker that some wise people, I think, have given to it, and I, I think that's the best description of it. You go back to, okay, how did we approach the Cold War? What worked, what didn't work? When did it change? Why did it change? What did we need to make those changes? Now let's apply lessons learned to this conflict, also an ideological conflict. What are the strengths? What are the weaknesses? How, what assets are you going to need? What kind of vulnerabilities could we take advantage of? What will we need to do that? And you work all of that out, you can begin to see some opportunities. But at a minimum, you know that they involve trying to have strong allies and alliances, trying to, uh, trying to be strong militarily, trying to be credible and consistent philosophically, being clear-eyed about the nature of the conflict, and being, here's something we forgot both Joe to talk about. How can you win a war without ever talking about it to the people that you lead? Right. You know, where's Churchill today? I, I love George Bush, but one of the, in fact, the only big argument I, I think I ever had with him is, why don't you explain your decisions? There's some good basis for them. You have to, part of leading is bringing people along with you. Why is what you did the right thing to do, and why do we have to stay the course? Um, his explanation was always a little bit like Lincoln's. You know, well, if I'm right, I'm right. If I'm wrong, it won't make matter and all that. But and Barack Obama, he doesn't want to explain anything because, first of all, he doesn't really even believe in the goals, with all due respect. And as a result, he's not about to talk about it. He wants to talk about other things. Well, is it no wonder that the American people are despondent over this, have no will to fight it, uh, when all they see is the downside, guys coming back with, a, with an arm blowing off, uh, if they come back, and a, a lot of cost? Uh, without any explanation whatsoever about why this is important, without the president standing up there uh, leading the people as to why we have to pull together and support this and sacrifice. Remember Henry Kissinger said something a long time ago, it really rung true at the moment. He said, part of the reason that Europe doesn't help us and doesn't really want to get involved in anything is that uh, their leaders have lost the capacity to get their people to follow them in any sacrifice. There, there's nothing to be for, so why would you ever want to sacrifice? People have to have a reason to be for something. It has to be deeply philosophical. Now, it can be nationalistic. That's not really all that good. But so part of winning this is to be able to talk about it with principles in mind that motivate the American people to be supportive of good policies. I, <laughs> you're welcome to, I was going to ask you more about Pakistan, which strikes me as one of our most important allies, but our least reliable ally. But you're welcome to pick up on this idea because I think it's an important one uh, that if we don't have stuff, we're not if, if we don't believe in the value of freedom. Right. And on a lot of our campuses, we don't. We're actually right. negotiating with the Organization of Islamic Cooperation, now named, to uh, prohibit internationally the defamation of Islam, which would be, a, seems to me, a blatant violation of the First Amendment of the Constitution. But if we don't really believe in free speech, if we don't really believe in the value of freedom, if we believe that other values are equally good, well, what is there to fight for, really? Yeah, no, I, there's, I, I think John stated it very eloquently. I mean, this is the whole question of relativism, really, uh, uh, and, and a, 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 a reluctance of some people to judge. But, you know, there are rights and wrongs, and uh, there's better and worse. And uh, we, uh, if you believe that, you have, to, you have to say it. That's a responsibility of leaders in a democracy, or, or else the mob will uh, influence uh, uh, foreign policy uh, to a greater degree um, than any of us would uh, want it to. So I, I don't really, I think John stated it uh, very, very well. I'm going to just give you, yeah. by the way, just one quick example. I, I told you I was uh, on the Khyber Pass just before 9-11. We met with Mashar uh, on that uh, Intelligence Committee trip, and one of the things he pleaded with us to do is to restore military to military contacts. Right. He said that my generals are very loyal to me. They all uh, were educated at Sandhurst or West Point, 
dealing with the Brits and Americans from day one in their military careers. But he said, the colonels and below, I'm really worried about because uh, you cut off all contacts with us because of the Pressler Amendment. Because, and I guess that was because they developed the nuclear weapon. As I, I, I'm not that old, so I don't remember all this. <laughs> but um, there, there's an example where we wanted a, uh, we, we had a goal, we had a principle, we had a policy. And by golly, if they didn't adhere to it, we were going to punish them. And talk about cutting off your nose to spite your face. And that was Musharraf's point. You have now created a real problem for yourselves and for me. You need to go back. And by the way, <laughs> within about two weeks, we had begun the process of restoring military to military contacts with, yeah. uh, with Pakistan, which is a very good thing. But it just shows you how things are not perfect in this situation. You've got to be careful about the, the action and reaction and think about the long, long term. I'm sorry to interrupt. No, 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 no. No, I'll just say briefly uh, that our relations with Pakistan are probably, at the one and the same time, the most complicated and consequential of, uh, it's hard to think of another country that's both comp so complicated and so consequential because obviously they're a nuclear power, they're in a very uh, strategically important part of the world. Um, and you know, they've gotten away with uh, really being on both sides or different parts of even their government being on both sides. So, you know, I can tell you that uh, in many ways over recent years, they've given us very substantial uh, counterterrorism assistance. And yet, on the other hand, we know that parts of their intelligence community are actually supporting terrorist groups. Uh, I can't think of any, any other nation quite like that. And of course, we, we rant and rave. We come to crises, and um, now we're in a better place. For now, right now, we're, we seem to be in a, in a, in a, a cooperative calm uh, uh, period. I've always felt, I'll just end with this about Afghanistan, that how we end this is important, and that it, that's why I think it's so important that we're negotiating a longer-term strategic relationship and that we successfully conclude it, that we do better than we did in Iraq. I think Iraq would be in a lot better shape if we had 10 or 15,000 American troops there, backup trainers, et cetera, uh, not leaving the ground open totally to Iran to come in and, and put more pressure on the Iraqi government than the Iraqi government really wants. Uh, so uh, I hope that, uh, one, the drawdown from Afghanistan is not precipitous of our troops because it's clearly not what our military wants. And secondly, that we leave some group of, some, some uh, deployment of, of our troops there. And one of the most important reasons to do that is the message it sends to Pakistan. Because, you know, the conventional wisdom, you say it so much, you wonder whether it's really true. Well, of course they, some elements in their intelligence service support the Taliban and other uh, uh, terrorist groups because they're positioning themselves for the day which they know will come when we again leave. And uh, they see, leave Afghanistan, leave the region, and they see um, Iran coming in more to Afghanistan but really, India. So we have to convince them uh, that by our only, by, not by words, by, by our decisions that we're going to stay in they, there. And of course, they have to it, buy the insurance policy from us, not the other guys. You got it. And, and um, you know, beyond, beyond Pakistan and beyond Afghanistan, th this whole area, just look around the neighborhood, Iran, uh, the stands, et cetera, this is a very strategically significant part of the world now, also econ with grow growing economic importance. So uh, not just for Afghanistan, but really for ourselves, it would be good to have, we don't use the word bases anymore. It would be good to have some joint operating facilities in Afghanistan. <laughs> uh, I'm going to ask another question while I, they're answering. If you want to ask a question, signal me and I'll try to try to come to you. Uh, but before I do, I do want to get there's certain things I do want to make sure I got on the table. We have reset our relations with Russia. I think that's fair to say. I'm not sure Russia has reset its relations with us. Is that also fair to say? Yes. After the election, my friend. <laughs> <laughs> Will you pass it, pass it on to Vladimir? Yeah. <laughs> the, the, Flexibility. Yeah. Flexibility. So the strange thing about John, Kyle, and me is that after the election, when we're going to be out of office, we're going to be more inflexible. <laughs> uh, some might might wonder if that could be, but <laughs> in my case, only my case. Uh, you know, th th this is this is a um, 
a great frustration, obviously. You can uh, understand the new President Obama uh, with a different point of view than, than many of us, uh, hoping that uh, hit the, the, uh, through the dent of his intelligence and personality and different point of view that maybe the Russians would be receptive to a new approach uh, which w is sort of the anti-Bush uh, uh, approach. You, you can understand why he might think he could succeed at that and uh, therefore try this out. Mm -hmm. So I'm not uh, cr criticizing him for trying. Um, you can question whether he, he should reasonably have come to that conclusion, but nonetheless, he, he tried it. I hope that he is shrewd enough to appreciate that it has failed. It is not likely to succeed because of a variety of reasons and that you can't keep going down the path chasing after somebody that doesn't want anything to do with you right now uh, without doing some damage to yourself. And you can see a lot of different places where that's occurred. Just to cite one example, the very uh, difficult situation that has been created with the Czech Republic, with Poland, uh, with our missile defense system, which I would argue is now pretty well shredded. And um, just to mention one example. No, missile defense is nowhere, I don't think no, no people know that, and this is something you've been a champion on, missile defense is nowhere near where it should be to protect the homeland, and nuclear modernization, despite promises, is going nowhere. Am I right? Uh, it, it, well, nuclear modernization may be going backward, which is uh, not good. And in terms of the homeland, remember there, there are sort of two elements of missile defense. So there's the protection of the homeland, which people generally associate with what we call the GBI system, the ground-based interceptor. The Obama administration has cut way back on the numbers of those, on the deployment, and on the uh, development of the new generation. The generation of kill vehicle is about 20 years old. We'd like to, to put the new generation of kill vehicle on it to be much more robust. No, they've uh, cut the funding for that. The other part of it is the system that can be both, depending on how it's deployed, a, an effective American defense system and protect regional um, uh, interest such as Europe, for example, from a, a threat from, for example, a country like Iran. Uh, the great announcement that the administration made in Ballyhooed, I would say, to, to provide the rationale for cutting way back on the GBI was we're going to have something even better, this new four-stage four stage, um, developed uh, Aegis system. Uh, now, and of course, everybody said, wait a minute, the fourth stage of that can be very effective, including potentially against an errant Russian missile, a, a missile launched by mistake or, uh, or perhaps by, uh, by a rogue commander. Or, In any event, uh, the Russians are now saying, under no circumstances should you develop that. So not only do they object to a missile defense system that might potentially be effective against them, uh, let alone other countries, they also... Uh, have been putting enough pressure on that I wonder if the administration is really going to go forward with what they characterized as the substitute for GBI, namely the fourth phase of the, uh, of the phased approach of Aegis. Ken, you wanted to ask a question right there? Um, Ken Olson from Westport, Connecticut, yeah. my favorite senator. <laughs> um, That's why I called it. <laughs> That's pretty good. I think that a couple of lessons have been learned over the last 10 years and maybe even the last five years and, and not the least of which is elections don't mean democracy. And I think, I wonder if there are people in this world who just don't want democracy. And, and is that necessarily a bad thing in particular parts of the world? And how do we in the US respond to that if, that, if I, what I posture is possible? Uh, well, it's great to see you, Ken, thanks. Um, so, Generally speaking, I would say, from what I've observed, uh, people do want democracy. Uh, they, they may settle in with dictatorship for a while, but, but ultimately there's a natural human yearning for freedom and an opportunity, a, a t economic opportunity. I went in with John McCain to uh, Egypt and Tunisia within a month after the uh, Arab Spring uprisings, and I was really quite fascinated to talk to the uh, people who led both of those revolutions. And one point that struck me was that they were motiv motivated as much by a feeling of economic outrage as they were by their desire for political freedom. In other words, that they had a, had a feeling that the, the countries were, uh, the, the, the leadership clique, the dictatorial <coughs> clique at the top 
was consuming uh, most of the wealth of the country, and here they were. Uh, um, as somebody uh, I was with on a program a while ago said that these were the middle class poor, educated, um, on the internet, knowing all the opportunities out in the world, and yet couldn't find a job in Egypt or Tunisia. So I, I, I don't know. I'd, I'd say that um, uh, maybe people develop a, uh, a sort of comfort for a while with dictatorship, but ultimately, <laughs> it doesn't work. And that, and I mean, we know that from our own uh, from our own history, and from again from our founding ideals. So I, I think. We're always at, at peril when we accommodate ourselves to dictatorships. Clearly, we, we have over our history, and, um, uh, and we continue to in some cases, but it, it's not a good bet in the long run. We could go on for a very long time, and I would like to, but we don't have the time. There's something else I want to do while they're here, and that is to present an award. Um, Senator Lieberman, Senator Kyle, again, I want to thank you both very much for honoring us with your presence and talking so candidly and interestingly with us. And I do now have the privilege of presenting each of you with an award named for one of our country's finest diplomats. Ambassador Jean J. Kirkpatrick was instrumental in establishing the foundation for defense of democracies in the wake of the September 11, 2001 attacks. And much of FDD's work today is based on her deep commitment to advancing democratic values and institutions. Ambassador Kirkpatrick spent her life studying totalitarianism and fighting totalitarianism. She understood early on also that the collapse of the Soviet Union would not mark the end of the struggle between freedom and tyranny. Instead, the totalitarian threat and challenge would take new forms, and indeed it has, as we've discussed today. Ambassador Kirkpatrick's story, if you don't know it, I'm going to tell it to you very briefly. It's quintessentially, quintessentially American. She was born in rural Oklahoma. She was raised by a dollar a day roughneck during the Great Depression. She became, by dint of brains and hard work, what she called an action intellectual, which I think is a great model for FDD and for the work, kind of work we try to do with the help of people like Senator Liebman and Senator Kyle. And she became a maker of history, not just a student of history. Ambassador Kirkpatrick was the first woman appointed to serve as the permanent representative of the United States to the United Nations, and I think she was one of the great UN ambassadors. She served as a member of Ronald Reagan's cabinet. For this and for her career in service, Ambassador Kirkpatrick was awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the nation's highest civilian honor. And we at FDD are honored to have known Gina Kirkpatrick, to have worked with her, to have learned from her, and we continue to honor her legacy and example. And to that end, it is particularly gratifying for me to present the first award named in her memory and her honor to Senators Lieberman and Kyle. Senator Lieberman, let's give a round of applause for them right now. Right, right, right. And also, just briefly, Senator Liebman, I've had the privilege of knowing you since you were first elected to the U.S. Senate about a quarter of a century ago. I was a reporter for the New York Times back then, and I had the great privilege of covering, uh, in particular, Senator Liebman, Senator Daniel Patrick Moynihan, and Senator Bill Bradley. And I got to tell you, I had a lot of fun. <laughs> that was a great job to have. And over the years, you have fought <clears throat> consistently to expand freedom's reach at home and abroad. My staff and I were honored when in the aftermath of the September 11th attacks, you became a distinguished advisor to this organization and a member of our leadership council. And a great credit to you also is the talented and dedicated staff you have assembled and has worked for you so loyally over the years. It is a treat and a privilege that we get to work with them. We have, uh, I just need to say that. Senator Kyle, working with you and your staff also immensely talented people, smart, dedicated on a range of issues, has been an honor, but it's also been an education. I've learned so much from you about missile defense. See, I know what GB, I know he uses those acronyms, I know what he means. You have been singularly committed to policies that promote peace through strength. You have steadfastly opposed any efforts to compromise the United States' national defense. Your expertise on a range of issues is unmatched in the U.S. Senate and will be greatly missed. And you have fought a good fight that must continue to protect the American homeland, to protect America's allies. You've earned a rep reputation for strategic thinking on matters of great complexity. Senators, in light of your many accomplishments, 
in defense of national security and defense of freedom, I'm proud to present you the Foundation for Defense of Democracy's inaugural Ambassador Gene J. Kirkpatrick Award. It's sitting right next to you. It's a little bit heavy, but you guys are strong young guys. So pick it up. Please join me in congratulating Senators Kyle and Lieberman. Thank you. Thank you all. Thanks for the word. Thank yes, you may. Thank you. Yes, you may. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. You're both welcome to say a couple of words here. Right, right, right. And we'll get some pictures too. Uh, Cliff, uh, Cliff, thanks very much. Um, when I think about it, uh, Cliff's movement from the New York Times to FDD is a little like my movement from the Democratic Party to being an independent. <laughs> uh, I, uh, I am, uh, I'm really honored by this. I'm honored because of my great admiration for uh, the uh, FDD. Uh, it's a unique organization here in Washington and throughout the country. Really, I, I like the phrase of action intellectual. Uh, you produce some um, really thoughtful work that informs policy, and you've also been very effective advocates. Secondly, I'm really honored to be um, received this award in the name of Jean Kirkpatrick, um, another independent Democrat. She might have been so independent she became a Republican. I don't know. But <laughs> <laughs> she was an inspiration uh, to watch, uh, both to read her stuff and watch at the UN, and a real honor to accept this award with my colleague and really dear friend John Kyle, uh, who is, uh, you know, the model of what a public servant should be. He's, he works very hard. He, he, he was gifted with some brains to start out with, but he really uses them and, um, and is thoughtful. Uh, and uh, in this uh, extremely, uh, almost reflexively combative uh, political climate, he happens to be a gentleman. And uh, that matters. Uh, it's been my honor, really, to work with him uh, on many issues of common interest over the years. I look forward to continuing it in what one of our Senate colleagues called the, calls the afterlife. Um, <laughs> but for today, I'll just say that I am therefore triply honored to receive this award uh, from the FDD in the name of Gene Kirkpatrick with John Kyle. Thank you. Thank you, Joe. Well, Joe, Joe put it right, it is a triple honor, first of all, uh, to be honored by FDD with the great leadership of Cliff May. Uh, the Gene Kirkpatrick Award with my colleague Joe Lieberman. I mean, it doesn't get much better than that, and I am just deeply honored. And as, as Joe said, I think we both view this as sort of the, the end of uh, the first half of the ball game, and uh, pretty soon we're going to start the second half, and you ain't seen nothing yet. How's that? <laughs>